All right, so I wanted to get these out of the way before we go back into creature design because I feel like um, a nice little break from that is also good to talk about form and composition. Composition is apl applicable whether or not you're doing, uh, you know, it doesn't matter the subject. Uh, composition is always key. It's applicable no matter what theme you're under when you're drawing. I'm sorry again about my voice. I'm really sick, so I might most likely will lose it halfway through the class and it'll start breaking. Um, I will try to make the class a little shorter today just so that I could spare my voice a little. <clears throat> um, okay, so w one of the biggest issues that I have with this painting is that it's so wonderful. It's that, that, that A lot of it is really, really beautiful, but there are a couple of issues that are really limiting it. Um, if you want to extend the focal point let me get my red. If you want to extend the focal point and have the whole focal point be from here to here, this is forgivable. It's also stylistic and reinforced by the fact that you're painting very painterly, so very rough strokes, not too clean. Uh, rough edges are just always beautiful to look at. But this is the issue. What's happening is this is very painterly. This is painterly, sudden contrast. It's all throwing off the composition. It's throwing off the focal point as well. So what we have to do is bring in detail here. Whether you like it or not, you're gonna have to start bringing in detail. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. I'm also gonna, right here you have some contrast. So it's like you have, uh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna put some interest here, zero interest here. There's no, everything here is equally unimportant. This is low contrast, this is full, no clean edges. Pretty much the most detailed part of this section is this edge right here. It's really, really clean. Um, the face is a face, of course, it's the number one P POI of a, of, a co of a composition, and um, what we have to do now is we have to free focus all the contrast, all the interest, and all the detail, uh, the maximum detail that you're going to do um, would have to be refocused here. It is painterly, but in painterly paintings you can go extra painterly, but on the main radius where the where the detail starts, the, the main radiates outward, right? Because usually we have 100% detail and then 80 and then 70 and then 50. So this can't be the same detail level as this or can't be as messy as this. And this can't be as messy as, as this. This has to be very messy. So this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be bringing in some detail on this, bringing some contrast over here to give something of interest here, and I'm going to extend the canvas. The canvas needs to be a little longer or the girl needs to be let, take less space on the canvas if the canvas is supposed to be this size. So I'm just going to stick to the... actually it's not crop that I need. <clears throat> um, I'm so sorry about that, that was so weird. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be doing that because what's happening is we can't throw the, de the, the, the focal point on the edge of the canvas. The focal point never touches the edge of the canvas. Everyone write that back to me please. <clears throat> Can anyone explain why we don't let the focal point touch the edge of the canvas? What the, what is the edge of the canvas's job? What was it? What is its job? What is its job? Right, so I'm just gonna um, clean this up. So remember, maximum detail is the focal point. Minimum detail, the minimum amount, the the most minimum, <laughs> is on the edges of the canvas. They never share the same amount of detail. So someone explain to me why that's important, why we have to do it this way. Why do we have to follow this rule? Imagine you're holding a camera. Would you allow your camera to take a picture of something and throw that something into the edge? That's, that's a rule that you've broken when you do that. and You, you don't break rules till you know them thoroughly. You know, none of us here have earned that badge yet where we can break rules and really just get away with it. <clears throat> so I extended the canvas just a little bit, a little bit. I'm trying to connect this pattern that you have for the cloud so she can be a, have a little less, um, she can be a little more into the center of the canvas. Next what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in some detail on her face. You want it to be painterly but you cannot sacrifice the fact that the face is 100% detail. <clears throat> Let me to zoom out. When you do paint painterly, I'm so sorry about my cough, so when you do uh, zoom out, um, it gives you better control over the, the patterns you're creating with your brush strokes. So yeah, you want these patterns to be visible, 
but you also want to ap apply some detail. There are ways to apply detail without um, lessening the fact that it's painterly. So you can still bring in detail. And all I'm doing right now is my brush is not shrinking in size. What's happening is I shrink it just a little bit just now because it's the lid. But uh, that's the really the way to keep it painterly. Our brush just went up a couple a couple points. But you just have to stay in the same brush size, just around the same brush size. It's not a detectable change in size, like over here, like one massive stroke like this. We can't bring in these kinds of brush strokes on the face, like unless they are really big parts. <clears throat> so this and this right here, yeah, you can bring in a big brush stroke. But all I'm doing right now is bringing in the detail. And when you bring in detail, you zoom in. But ever so slowly, we're not zooming in all the way. This is still quite a zoom in. And she's supposed to be blind, so I'm going to be kind of just bringing that in. Zoom out again. And all I'm doing is bringing in detail. I'm working fast because I'm pulling from a visual library, so it's pretty much just filling all these spaces in for me. I'm also trying to cast shadows. So let's see what people said about the focal point. Focal point uh, is never on the edge of the canvas, so viewers don't leave the composition. Excellent! So you guide the viewer's eyes constantly within the edges of the canvas. The edges of the canvas are not supposed to be noticeable. Nothing is supposed to, no point of interest is supposed to be half visible. It's a point of interest. So that's what the photograph frame, that's what the photograph uh, camera is framing. So that's what we have to do. We have to make sure no POIs ever touch the edge of the canvas. This cast shadow and this cast shadow are both responding to the same light source. We have to keep them the same temperature. And all I'm doing is just bringing in detail, balancing symmetry, casting some shadows. Maybe a shadow will be cast on this eye right here. I have to zoom out to make sure it's accurate. <clears throat> Also, you need to make it so that the eyes seem like they're looking in the same direction, even if she's blind. So what's happening now is that this excess of dirtiness in the brush strokes is gone. And it's being replaced by the same texturally uh, patterns, but on a smaller brush stroke, because we're trying to indicate this is a point of interest. So it can't have the same amount or the, the same uh, lack in detail as something that is on the edge of the canvas. So you can't put a POI on the edge of the canvas and you can't paint a POI as if it's on the edge of a canvas. All right. Just trying to connect these shadows here. You can leave some of these, you know, these little bit, bits and pieces out here. You can leave some of those in there, but we still want to see some detail. Beautiful colors on the lips, by the way, and on the whole face itself. Make sure that you don't have details where they're not supposed to be, like you know, that extra little mess you had on the chin that was reading as something else, even if it's painterly. Some of you think that painterly means it can break the rules. Why is that wrong? Can anyone explain why painting painterly is not an excuse to paint to break the rules? What do you have to do in order to paint painterly and paint a successful painterly painting? So I'm trying to cast some shadows here. This is all bringing in detail. All these little unblended edges bring in detail. I'm also going to do some color correction. Uh, blind eyes, usually if the base color is a bluish or grayish, you want to connect that all around. Also, eyes don't reach white unless they gr glow. And I don't recommend full glow, even if the eye is glowing, because it only takes so much to make an eye glow or feel like it's a little bit lighter than usual and it's usually a shade that's pretty close to light gray or a little less than that. <clears throat> also, um, again, so sorry about that. Um, whoopsie. The edge right here, you should just remove that. And then to make the eye feel like it's glowing, now that we have a nice clean base, what we can do now, I did use soft brush, I'm sorry, I just have to hurry it along. <clears throat> we just have to just slowly build it up and then erase away bits that are being hidden by the eyelids. 
and then um, on one side of that it just gets really bright. So duplicate, duplicate, merge. So just one side really that gets all that glow. You really don't need to make the whole eye glow just as one big light source to convince us that it's a pretty light eye. We will see that it's light just by comparing it to this to the local shade around it. Also, sometimes you don't need to darken lighten the eye. All you have to do is darken the surrounding area. So I'm going back to that brush stroke over here. And now it really feels like it's glowing just because I've added a darkness around the pupils. Again, you want to keep the temperatures of shadows the same all around. You don't want to get like a suddenly dark dark over here where it really doesn't belong because it's not really a dark spot. You want to just generally keep them. All the rules still apply in painterly paintings. Painting, let me see what everyone is saying. Painterly is about having confidence in your knowledge of the form and choosing not to blend in specific areas, yeah? Yes, Lena. Understanding the rules to loosen them up when it comes to your brush strokes. F, just perfectly said. Free fires on a roll today. Um, yes, you have to have a good command over the rules and fundamentals in order to get away with a painterly painting because it's not a breaking of the rules when you do a painterly painting. It's just a strategic um, omission of some rules and exaggeration of other rules. And how are you supposed to strategically do that if you don't know what the rules are? So all I'm doing right now is bringing in just a touch more detail to this area here so that in comparison to this, this actually looks like a POI. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, I'm losing my voice. So I'm like, no lady. Alright, so I'm just going to bring in some extra hair pieces right here. The way to shade hair, a lot of you were confused. You just have to choose where the light source is and that's where the dark side of that hair piece is. You just have to make sure that when you highlight them, you highlight them along their curves, so which areas really are exposed. So I'm not really shrinking my brush, but I'm give, bringing in detail to the hair. <clears throat> but in a painterly painting, you can break this rule. You don't have to bring in, you can just keep the hair strokes really flat. And you would still get away with it. Alright, so I just want to bring in some more detail. It feels really, really empty. And that was the biggest issue. The brush stroke isn't changing that much. I'm just trying to, I mean the brush size, sorry. I'm just trying to exaggerate that the detail here can be possible and still maintain painterly texture. Just you know, so just bringing in slight suggestions of texture. So painting painterly is really just a good command of, of creating <clears throat> suggestions of, of detail instead of actual detail. So the illusion of detail is what you're doing. So I'm not painting every single detail here, no, but it feels like it's detailed. Alright, so now that that's done, I just need to bring in some extra contrast just along this area. Let me see if I can get that. No. Okay, perfect. Just this color, just along here and a little brighter wherever the light touches it. So that we're leading the eye slowly upward. And these pieces here just need a little less contrast altogether because they are not part of the POI. So slowly our eyes are starting to come closer to this object. And areas where we can really bring in lots of form is just the way we create the, the how we shade the bigger pieces of the polygon. So just around the edges we darken and are along the brightest spots we just keep it bright. But out here is the darkest shade and that again is bringing in detail, it's bringing in an extra level of um, information. Oopsie. Ok, 
Okay, as for the glowy bits, I'm not sure you need full no man's land all around. Again, just like the eye, we can create the suggestion of brightness by bringing in just light where it's really needed. So darken. Really don't need all that brightness everywhere. All we have to do is just suggest that it's there. And if the face is glowing, if there is some sort of, I'm not sure what this tool is, probably like enlightenment or something, um, you have to make sure that this illumination is consistent around the rest of the face. So from a distance, I'm bringing in that white light. Normally, I think um, when we have a light coming from above, we have to just react to it somehow. So it would be really cool if you darken the entire eye area and just lightened it just a little bit where there seems to be a, a glow. That way we're reacting to see how the shadow is right here on the nose that you created, that the eye socket would also be shadowed. And that would give even more an opportunity for the light in the eyes to glow. I didn't lighten them at all, I just darkened what was around them. to bring in a different kind of glow pattern for the pupils. <clears throat> so merge down, merge down, merge down. So before, sudden contrast here, no contrast here, excess contrast here, really minimal amount of detail and then after we exaggerated the detail here, feels a lot more detailed than this area, has a lot more, but I didn't change the painting at all. I didn't change what you painted. All we did was complement what was already there. So before it was a little confused because we've got the brightness, the piece is almost at the edge of the canvas, this is not right, any tails, anything attached to the POI should not be at the edge of the canvas. It should significantly decrease in detail and yet we have this super realistic smoke pattern, probably from a stamp brush. Stamp brushes are really dangerous um, because they bring in all this crazy detail out of nowhere where it Detail probably doesn't belong. So I'm just going to try to make this a little less detailed over here. And if she is like a glowy person, like some sort of um, sage or some sort of bioluminescent thing, we have to <clears throat> set it up so that she can really glow. Um, I think it would have been really, really cool if you... Uh, darken the entire canvas just a little bit more. So I'm going to choose like a blue. Just throw that over. Get darken. That's beautiful. I just love the, the what darken does to a painting. And just erase away. Where, um, where everything happened just to darken it just a little more so it feels like a, a dark room. Also, I think I should go back a couple pieces because um, this light would be casting a shadow off the hood. So there might be a chance to just cast a slight shadow here. Just a slight one so it feels like we're responding to that light source. When you ignore a light source like that, it really does mess up the painting, so casting a nice little shadow there also might help. Just um, helping the hue along as well. The brown still looks brown, but now we have a wash. If you want to go that direction. But before? Before? after. Just a little bit more focus. I would actually go even more and um, and detail the face even more. And really what you have to do in order to detail a face well, at this point is to just bring in, to exaggerate dark spots, and to sharpen dark spots. You can make the whole face blurry as all hell, but if the dark spots are nice and sharp, like the edge of the nostril, edge of the lip, all of those areas will help the painting along. So little bits of white just around the lips. <clears throat> Sharper cast shadows as well also brings in detail. Water lines, I'm going to choose the flesh color. That brings in detail. 
um, extra darkness around the lashes brings in detail. All that stuff makes it more interesting to look at because now we our eyes are guided along. Okay, so I'm going to flatten this out. Remember, never allow a point of interest to be sit on the edge of a canvas. Okay, so last time I talked about how gesture lines uh, help a an animal feel more believable, help its position kind of be, or its role, and its habitat makes sense. So right now what we have is this upright kind of carnivorous um, gesture line where the spine and everything in the whole body is anticipating helping the animal bite something and stay on that something and keep it down uh, so it can hunt and it can eat. Um, it's got canines, it's got some sort of uh, beetle mouth here or ant mouth. <clears throat> so you definitely used the lizard face, really really well done. The A little bit of the nostrils, I think, of the turtle the turtle, well, the turtle shell, but really the turtle, the turtle body, um, just around the head as well, kind of seems a little bit lizardous, um, or you know, just amphibian-ish. I'm not sure what the word is, but it looks very reptilian. Um, other areas here, I don't, they don't really feel like they're really influenced, uh, but you could just be seeming the, seeming the, the anatomy along. It probably has the lizard feet. Um, <clears throat> it feels very armored, and that's fine as well because it is a it is a hunter. Uh, another problem, though, it isn't um, related to the anatomy or the believability or the design, but really the form. What you've done here is you've really, really darkened it too much. What we need to see is w sort of an indication of wh where where the what the color is. Is it well? It seems like a ground creature. That wasn't identified, but it seems like to be a, like a like a pack, like it's part of a pack. Um, so that would mean that it would have to be able to camouflage or hide in its surrounding. The color of a lion is almost the exact same color of the Serengeti. And if you've ever seen a lion hunting, it's almost impossible to spot them. <clears throat> this is why I keep stressing the fact that camouflaging, sorry I didn't spell that right. Um, I keep stressing the fact that the animal is a, is directly the way it's designed is a direct reflection of its habitat. That's what the uh, that's what it, it comes hand in hand. So when you're choosing colors and values and your background is this gray, it means you really haven't considered that massive facet of design. So when they camouflage, they do two things: they lower their ears down so the pattern of their ears isn't discernible from against all of that grass. So a, a, the prey wouldn't be able to detect them being hunted. So that ears usually go down when a cat pounces. If you ever own a cat that's about to pounce on something, pounce on something, its ears disappear. Um, it's because they're great hunters. They have to camouflage. Their color is really monotonous <clears throat> and really impossible to detect. So that's something you really, really have to do. What is this? You have to merge your your animal and its surrounding and its surrounding colors and its surrounding values, all of that stuff. I, as I'm trying to think about the zebra, because I just saw the picture. The zebra is does not fit in any kind of surrounding whatsoever, but it does fit into its pack. So that's kind of how it um, stays from being like it is supposed to be hunted. It's a big, it's a big piece of deli meat um, that's waiting to be eaten. Really, the zebras and anything else that has almost no defense whatsoever. It's a complete herbivore. Um, all it can really do is hide behind its friends, hoping they get eaten instead of it. But when it comes to a hunter whose sole purpose is to catch and eat to survive and make babies, it's going to need camouflage. So I don't think this color really would uh, help it hide in, in, a, in a brightly lit sand environment. So that was one of the requirements. Either you design them in the sky or you design them in the sand or, you know, like a desert environment or sky habitat. So I'm just trying to darken where the darkness really is needed. <clears throat> Sorry about my soft brush. But before he was just too dark. Like unless he's a he's um uh, like really really like nocturnal, like can't go outside in the day at all. Usually hunters are very versatile. They can hunt both in the day and night. Usually they prefer nighttime because it's easier to, to hunt at night. They have some kind of um, nocturnal vision or something like that. But uh, 
even on the form level, even just with basic principles and, and fundamentals and art, going this dark too soon is not a good idea. We really need a chance for detail, and if you're using or depending this much on contrast to get a read for the form, it means that there's a weakness in your ability to detail. And no detail here, no detail here. Large plates of armor instead of a smooth skin surface or a smooth um, scaly surface or whatever, you're depending too much on the larger piece of, to detail for you. My voice is just completely almost gone. <clears throat> so I recommend deciding where this animal lives. How does it, who does it, where does it live and what does it hunt? Uh, determining those two massive things will help you design it. You've definitely designed the anatomy, anatomy spot on. I love the design. Definitely feels like a runner. Feels like something like a cheetah body if you've ever seen one. Um, but uh, but everything else seems to be <clears throat> really weak and uh, like my voice and uh, hard to decide really where it's living if it's a mountain creature if it's a sand creature if it is a mountainous creature it might benefit from a darker skin just being like a darker animal um, but remember the way they designed toothless uh, they basically made him out to be the most dangerous um, predator of, of the skies, the most dangerous dragon of them all. Once you see it, you're dead. He's pitch black. He's called a night fury, so he travels only at night. He's got the craziest belch of fire that could probably burn down an entire town. His entire design is aerodynamic. <clears throat> he's nocturnal. And he's just, he's fully like streamlined design. It's, it's, it's really just, it's designed to make sure that he catches his prey. They, they did make him cute, so there's no, you know, limitation on cuteness. Cuteness can be applied to anything. But uh, you just have to think about it like that. He would not feel so menacing or so dangerous in How to Train Your Dragon Part 1 if he was, like, another color. But look at all the other dragons. Um, they look ridiculous. They were, like, such secondary, <clears throat> secondary looking dragons. Because they were so colorful, they didn't make any sense. But here, he's like full utility design. He's like a Swiss army knife of a dragon. Compared to the other designs, that probably the first or third sketch in the concept art, they went with it. But this guy, they designed him with thought in it, with, with a lot of thought applied. And what color should he be? Which part should be lit? Which part should be blue? They're like, you know what, fuck it, let's just make the whole guy black. Because he's supposed to be a super predator at nighttime. And he would not have felt so threatening at first uh, in the movie when they introduced him. Of course, they made him cute, but he would not have felt threatening if he wasn't this, if, if he didn't have this kind of design backing his character up. But all these guys, I barely felt a threat from them. I mean, they don't even function properly. Uh, the wings were so tiny. They were basically a joke, but this guy is perfectly balanced with his wings. He's got so much strength to him, and his wingspan complements his design. So they did a lot of work on this guy, and that's exactly what you have to think about. If he is a nighttime, if he is a darker colored animal, would he survive? Would he be able to hunt? Would he be able to camouflage? Is he a daytime hunter or a nighttime hunter? Where does he live? Doesn't he need to camouflage the surrounding environment? Always compare back to a lion, I'm telling you. The way the lion has been designed, he hasn't won the, 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 the title of the king of the jungle or the most crazy predator. Even if it's undeserved, he still got it. Uh, because uh, his design is so optimal. So you just have to compare back to that, or the wolf, or the arctic wolf. Both are the scariest motherfuckers you've ever seen. If you see one, you're dead. <laughs> Not really, but if you see an angry one or a hungry one, yeah, you're screwed. So I, I suggest making him lighter, whatever you choose, is basically the point. Even if it's sky habitat or desert. This one is so cute and so fucking adorable. <laughs> I love these sketches. <laughs> so let's see what this adorable person wrote. Eye pattern on uh, Finn is used to confuse and scare the enemy. So normally walks closer to the ground. Um, when in danger, it flips its body up and flushes blood into its back for fat back fin and rattles it in a hypnotizing way, swings tail side to side. All right, so you've indicated two major muscles that are being used on something that will be called on regularly for the animal to defend itself. If an animal is going to be sitting on its hind legs, those hind legs need to be strong enough so that this animal can sustain its the fact that it's on its hind legs for so long so that it can defend itself and rattle its little fin. All right, so what it does is it basically acts, makes itself bigger. If these little tiny stubby legs are all it has, it won't be able to jump on one leg. It would just go up for a second and then come back down. 
Also, this tail is a tiny little short, shorty little tail. What, we, what needs to happen is you need to reorganize the entire weight distribution on the animal so that these major things that you've indicated work. So what I recommend is <clears throat> shrinking, whoopsie, shrinking the lower body. If, if, if it evolved in a way where it defend, defends itself by standing on its hind legs, what would happen is all of its weight would be sent over here. And it would be really light up here. So when it is up there, it's got a nice little head, a nice little upper body, and a massive lower body so that when it gets up on its legs, it can defend itself. Now, where has this happened in the real world? Oh, I know, kangaroos. Kangaroos look like... They look ridiculous. After a while, they're just, they just started walking on their hind legs. Not only do they depend on them, but look at the length of their tail. They definitely use their tail for support and for fighting. Their arms are a nice length. They're basically a rat. <laughs> massive, massive ass legs of probably half the body weight and a tiny little head. And it's probably smaller than it seems because that's all fur. All right, so whatever animal depends on its hind legs, that's what's going to be biggest, and that's what we covered last time. Whatever it depends on, whatever it's going to be moving a lot of, that's what's going to be. Uh, that's what's going to be the, the biggest. All right, so the reason why um, the, our, our femur is the largest skeleton in the body, the reason why the hand has the most skeletons in it, or the most skeletal count, the reason why our tongue is the strongest. Um, muscle in our entire body is because it's used a lot. It's If something is used a lot in the animal's design, that's your giveaway. That's the giveaway. That's when you make that thing bigger. <clears throat> All right. Um, although it looks cooler on hind legs. Kangaroos are scary. Yes, they are. Uh, yes, so I recommend just giving him a more of a herbivore curvature for its... For its um, not a herbivore, but like a, you know, a tank, not really an ADC, <laughs> a tank kind of gesture line. So if the predator we saw earlier had a gesture line like this with really, really um, athletic body, this one really depends on its brute strength to defend itself when it's being ganged up, ganged up upon. And usually they travel in packs. So I would recommend a more downward curving spine gesture, a longer tail, that it has a really scary looking thing at the end of it. Alright, so something like that for it to swing once it gets on its massive hind legs. And because it's so low on the ground, the other the front legs would be a lot smaller and the hind legs would be a lot bigger. The curves down, the head would be shorter and and um, smaller, but it can still have its little horns. Because once it's it's got different ways of defending itself, mostly from the, 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 the rear, but it might be able to charge and attack. And we've seen other animals and other dinosaurs have this exact design. So we've seen this design before. Maybe it's you're inspired by it, maybe you didn't know. But um, that's pretty much it. You have to just re reorganize it. And ask yourself, what's the animal going to be using? Function is anatomy. That's the rule no matter what you're designing, no matter what it is. Function equals anatomy. Everyone write that back to me, please. All right. So uses tusks to drag dirt uh, to reach insects and plant roots. Very nice. Normally walks closer to the ground. Um, so yeah, the short legs would definitely be, be necessary for that, for it to reach that low into the ground and, and start scratching and finding food. Really, really good design. I love that you've indicated some you of know, the areas that you want to be, you want noticed, and um, the function that you thought of. But just remember, it's um, it's about which muscles are used, really. This is the uh, the crazy predator that we saw last time, and I have only one issue with the way you painted this. Uh, it's just a form problem. What happened is, you threw the the cast shadow of the tail as if he was against a wall so this would be the the creature and this would be the wall right here so he had a cast shadow going this way and a cast shadow going this way what would happen if he was on the ground which he is he's not really cornered against a wall what would happen is something like this and the tail would kinda just sit on the ground like that because there's a distance the, the, the head is closer to the ground than the tail so the cast shadow would be on the ground this way because this distance is greater than this distance. 
if it wasn't the same distance, if it was the same distance, yes, at that point, the tail would be close to the ground, but we would not see the tail. The tail would be down here. All right, but if the tail is up here, the, the shadow would be more fuzzy. Um, shadow would be a little less sharp when the light seems to be coming on an angle because this is extending past the perimeter. If the light was coming straight from above, then this would be aligned with the shadow but because this is all going in this direction and this is not aligned with the body, the light is coming at an angle. So if the light is coming at an angle, actually, this would end shorter. This would end much sooner. Let me just uh, cut that down. <clears throat> and it would be a lot more fuzzy as well because the more distant the cast shadow is from the object um, casting it, or the casts on, and for, the more distant it is from the light, the fuzzier the shadow will be. Any questions? Yeah. Um, function is present through anatomy. Excellent. Mm, yeah, probably. But it comes up first in a mental. Um, I don't know why you guys are talking about booty shakes. <laughs> Try not to talk about that kind of stuff in an art class. All right. So that's my biggest thing about this. Um, the color of the sand is a little bit too gaudy. I think you should lower the color a little bit and um, sh indicate where the light is coming from so you have a real chance to show off the moisture of the scales. Just along here, you have a lot of, you can, you can have a lot of fun with this. Show off where the, where the body kind of just fades into shadow. Like that. That's how you bring in detail, really, with contrast. Contrast definitely brings in detail. If you don't have time to depend on anything else. Just bringing in some shine where it happens. Okay, just carry that shadow all the way. And that's it. <coughs> so, before, see, it just really makes sense for the tail to, that, that was not appropriate. Oh, I'll just save. Okay, and then Terra Testa Lizard. Um, so Habitat Desert, beautiful, beautiful submission. You probably would probably win if there was an award for this. You would probably win the award. <laughs> um, but the habitat is desert. The type is carnivorous. Um, a hunting method, ambush predator, preys on rodents and small mammals, insects as well as birds and sometimes other small lizards, length up to 1.45 meters, um, and height up to 50 centimeters. So 1.64 feet in height and four, five feet in length. So basically me laying down, um, but I'm five foot three. <laughs> um, very strong pincers for digging as well as capturing and holding down prey. Thick retractable hairs to help digging as well as sensing vibrations when buried in judge position and size of prey. To judge position and size of prey, okay. Uh, fleshy bulb imitating a fruit to lure in prey. Beautiful. <laughs> that's great. That's like the, um, the, the one fish. Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, filled with poisonous fluids with paralyzing effect. If prey managed to reach and eat it before lizards can strike. Not only is it camouflage, it's got defense, it's got agile and runner capabilities, it's got massive hind legs, it's got that gesture line, it's the defense, the lure, the poison, the claws, and the teeth, and the armor. It's just, this thing is a killing machine. It's, you're fucked if you see this thing. Um, so that's how it lays in the ground, and it camouflages depending on the surrounding environment. This is beautiful. I love the submission. Um, initial sketch, and then it transformed to this. So initially he looked very herbivore because you see that very curved, kind of non-athletic gesture line for the design of the animal. But after that, realizing that it had to hunt and, you know, 
I really don't see a very much of a weakness in this animal. Maybe its stomach is its weakest area, but its stomach is always so close to the ground. This thing is pretty much, you know, death. If you stay, this one, this this one is the angel of death right here. And he made the gesture line more more athletic, more indicative of a carnivore and a hunter and a predator. This is beautifully done. This is amazing. I I just you know this is this is wonderful. This is something. Whoever did this, I'm very proud of you, and I love you very much. And um, this is something that you can and should and will throw into your portfolio. This is something that employers want to see. This is stuff that people love to see, thorough detail, um, considering all manners of function, what it's going to do, where it's going to adapt to. Um, I love how you did the, uh, the, 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 plant, the, the plates for the armor as if one is um, kind of layering on the other to provide even more support and even more layering of armor so that it's really, really versatile. If it falls, if it rotates, its tail is really long to help it get back on its belly. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful design. Really, really well done. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.